If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Today's guest is Heidi Hewitson. Heidi is a high school teacher in equine studies. She started off doing pony club, showing, western, polo cross and dressage and eventing and describes herself as a real all-round horse person. She's currently coaching as well as the equine studies. She's also coaching, competing and training in dressage and eventing. How are you, Heidi? I'm well, thanks. How are you, Glennis? Wonderful, wonderful. Heidi, we normally start off with a favourite quote. What have you got? I'm not that great with quotes, to be honest. I did have this fantastic moment when I first started to jump. I was very, very nervous about jumping. And I've just spent the last couple of days trying to find it, and I just can't find it. You know, it was along, it was along the lines of, you know, no pain, no gain, that, that type of thing. Yep, but yep. my more recent one I really like is ride every stride. Yes. I think that's uh, really important for, uh, you know, in your competition and your training, uh, every you notice a lot of people when they're show jumping, they sort of get to the end of the course and they go, you know, last jump and they flatten out a bit and I'm off the rail, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think the same in dressage, you will be riding around and you'll sort of tune out a little bit and you'll, you know, forget what you're doing or the movement's not quite right. But I, th- I so I think it's really important to just when you're training particularly dressage, and when you're competing, is to really ride every stride. Yeah, and I think you're riding to improve the horse all the time, aren't you? You know, that's that constant communication that you're riding, you're asking for just a little more roundness, just move over here a bit, you know, just straighten here, just change direction, just all all of those things just helps improve the quality of the riding and the communication with the horse. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Heidi, tell us about how you started with horses. I know you've had sort of a, a big variety of, you know, starting off in Pony Club, doing showing Western Polar Cross, you know, and going through like that. But do you have any first memories of the first time you had any contact with horses or one of your early memories? Yeah, well, I was one of those um, freak children that must have been completely obsessed with horses from a very young age. So by the time I was four years old, I'd convinced my very non-horses to actually buy me a pony. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've got these non, you know, like a lot of us have these very inexperienced parents. But, you know, I had this fantastic experience with my dad with school. My dad used to actually come and pick me up after school and I used to get to ride my pony home. So I thought oh, that was brilliant. special. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 And then, he, unfortunately, he died cold it quite early, and then I didn't get another pony till I was about seven. But being inexperienced again, they've gone and bought me a green broke mare who was just not really <laughs> suitable. Her name was Silla Black. She was pretty funny, but my parents ended up splitting up. This was in New Zealand, and then we came over to Australia. So I didn't really get to have my own real horse until I was about 12 years old Mm -hmm. and I'd been at a riding school for a few years and then the owner died and he actually left me $250. They couldn't give me one of the horses but the family gave me $250 so we went to Jindabyne Horse Sales and we bought a $250 horse from Jindabyne Horse Sales and he was my, my main horse for, you know, from 12 to 18, and he was a wonderful horse, and he was the one that I, you know, did all those things with, you know, went through Pony Club, went to showing, did a bit of polo across with him, did Western Pleasure with him, did sporting with him, took him to the Canberra Royal. He, he was an amazing horse. Yeah, yeah. So just to do with your career with horses, because you, you know, you obviously went through and trained as a high school teacher, but then you were able to pick up this job in equine studies, which is sort of combining your qualifications plus your passion, really. How did that work out? Was it like an application or was it something that you'd push for within the school? Yeah, it's just something that's come forward through the school. So 
I'm a science agriculture teacher, so I went through agriculture um, myself, loved agriculture because I found that that was the closest thing that got me to, you know, to studying horses at high school. Yep. So then I always wanted to be an agriculture teacher, so I, um, I you know, did a science degree and majored in agriculture so that I could become a agriculture teacher. And then I've just been, you know, at my local high school for nearly 20 years now, and it's we're literally 20 minutes from the new Willinga Park. Wow. So when, yeah, so we just managed this year. We've tried a couple of times to get it up and running, but for certain reasons it hasn't run. But this year we managed to get 22 girls interested in doing equine studies in year nine. It's brilliant, isn't so, it? Yeah. yeah, it's really good. So, I, you know, I still just, inverted commas, a high school teacher, but we have this equine studies program running through the school as an elective, mm, so yeah. that's pretty special. What do you think then, you know, working with the horses now, working with the girls teaching, so you're still sort of within the horse industry, but what do you think's the best thing about having that focus on horses? For the students in no, school, No, best thing mean? for you. You know, what do you like the best thing about that particular job? Yeah. I like the sharing, you know. I like, I like that, you know, we're all constantly learning. So, you know, I have the ability to share with the girls, like my wealth of experience that I've had. But I also like to hear, you know, what they're thinking and what they're doing. And, you know, because I've got a huge spectrum of girls in this class, you know. So I've got some special needs students that have gone to have ridden at riding, uh, Pegasus Riding for the mm. Disabled, right up to girls that have ridden at the national level. And so it's just it's just a really nice environment to be able to share different stories, different experiences and the latest research and to make sure, you know, just really focus so far on safety, you know, making sure that, you know, they're, they're good with safety aspects of horsemanship. And also we've been looking at some of the beating, you know, the Malcolm, you know, how the Malcolm bridles are sort of coming into bow and, mm-hmm. you know, that type of mm-hmm. thing. Yep. Yeah. 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 What if, if one of the girls said then, I'd like to work in the horse industry, what do you think are the core skills or character traits that they need to start working in the horse industry? Because some people make it, some people don't. You know, a lot of people say that they'd like to work with horses, like to work in the horse industry, but then they just don't make it. So what do you think of the things that keep people in the industry that, you know, you start them off just, you can tell within high school, but they're going to stay in the industry? Yeah, look, I have this theory, that, you know, I don't know how true it is, but I just know from the girls so I grew up in Canberra and we all had our, all my friend, high school friends had horses. So we had this core group and the agriculture together, like I said, and the agriculture teacher used to take us for horse riding for sport every afternoon. And I had this theory then that the earlier you get in it, the longer you stay in it, if that makes sense. So, you know, a lot of the girls are sort of teenage girls and they get into horses and then, you know, by 18, it's sort of, you know, that's, that's one of the things, so to speak, and, you know, as my boys come into the picture. But, you know, it's got to be a long-term love and a long-term passion for horses. You know, you absolutely have to have the ability to work hard. It's hard work. I've been to high-level coaches' places and, you know, had sort of boot camps there, and I see how hard those girls work. You know, they're working from dawn to dusk every day, you know, so you've got to have the ability to work really hard. And then I think the other thing is to to understand that it takes a long time to actually achieve something, you know. Like, you, do, you know, it's just not going to come to you. You know, you know, you might be lucky. You might have a, you know, a fantastic horse at the right time, at the right place, with the right coach, and you know, everything might fall into place. But I think for most people, it doesn't work that that well. Yes, you don't. You don't just get your first qualification and that's it. You're, uh, yeah, you're right. It's it's the constant learning. Yeah. 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 Definitely. There was something you said earlier. You know, the earlier someone gets into it, the longer they stay, and. And I know there's always someone that's going to break that rule, right? Because, you know, generally that's probably right. But I just talked to John Downs and he didn't Mm -hmm. get into it until he was like 30-odd and then continued and stayed and, you know, he works full-time with horses, he's ridden to advanced, he's show jumped, he's evented, he's done done all sorts of things. So, you know, just to break that rule, if some people are interested in that, they can go back and – and listen to his interview, but um, yeah, generally I think you're right. You know, people are yeah, no, a bit keen; no, they, they right. know. Yeah, 
and look, you know, Terry's now down. Terry's now down here at Wollonga Park. You know, he's coming to it very late. You know, Later. he's very yeah. passionate about it, and you know, so definitely. And I've heard of people's partners where the girls been horse mad, and then yes. they've you know they've got married, and then the partners had nothing to do with horses, and they've actually become uh, very good riders, very good com- competitors. So yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, I'm just using that as a generalisation, mm, but. Mm. I think you, you feel it generally, you know, especially with girls. They tend to feel it early, yeah. Tell us about people who've influenced you and helped you in your career because, you know, you talked about your teacher helping you and now you're helping your students. But who else has influenced you in your career with horses? I live in Ola Dolla and uh, there's a coach educator here called Gina Haddard. Yep. Uh, she's been an amazing influence in my life. She's, you know, a good friend and a really good coach. Um, I did a lot of my level one stuff um, with her. I think she's, she, I think she's one of the best coaches around. Mm, she's incredible. Yeah. More recently, I've had quite a bit to do with Heath Ryan. Yep. He, he's just an inspiration. His passion, you know, like he's he's just he's just there into the sport, you know, one hundred and twenty percent. You know, <laughs> you know, will give. You know, he's just so giving with his time and his. I don't know, I just find him really inspirational. He is, I think he he's is. really hard working. I think the whole family is really hard working and yep. yeah, they're, yep. they're great. They're he's great certainly people. Certainly in, inspirational. I think they had the record at a world championships. I can't remember, but it is on his interview where his parents were in the driving. His brother was going to, was shortlisted, but then I think his horse went lame, so he ended up being in the driving as well. I think Rosie was in the dressage and Heath was in the eventing, you know? So it was a real family sport, but at a very elite level. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they're amazing. Yeah, really, yeah. really amazing. Yeah. Now, you talked. And then I was just. Yeah, go on. Tell us about, about someone else. Oh, I was just going to mention um, also from a coaching, you know, coaching point of view, um, Chris Johnson. Mm-hmm. She does an amazing job. Just, I love her mannerism and her enthusiasm as well. and you know, she's really passionate about teaching and um, helping people get through their uh, accreditations, EA accreditations. Yep, yep. Now tell us about, and I know you said the $250 horse that you got from Genderbine Horse Sales, and we talked about your, your previous two before that. Is that the horse you think that influenced you the most, or have you had other horses since then that have influenced you? Oh, no, I've had a lot of horses. You know, I think he was just so good because – you know, you're a teenager and you've got all that time and, I've, you know, so you spent, put a lot of time and effort into him. So, you know, we just knew each other really well. Mm-hmm. You know, about 2000, um, I'd had a couple of other horses. I had a little Arab and I had a little stock horse in there and I wanted to do a bit more showing and a bit more dressage. They, they were getting a bit older. So for the first time, I actively looked for a horse for myself. Most of the other times, horses had been given to me or, you know, I picked them up cheaply. So... I went on, on the hunt for a horse and I, I thought I wanted a 15-2 bay, you know, stock horse gelding, quarter horse cross gelding, you know, some an all-rounder and I ended yep. up with this 16.2 hand thoroughbred dressage show horse. <laughs> so it was, you know, funny that I wanted what I thought I wanted and what I got were two different things. But he was a beautiful horse. He just gave his all and tried really hard. What happened with him was he, he was a very good dressage horse and then went, I, uh, my son stopped eventing. I decided that I wanted to do a vent. I'd watched him through Pony Club go through the, you know, eventing grade. Yes. So I decided I wanted to do a vent. So then I started trying to invent this 16-2, you know, show hack slash dressage horse, but he just wasn't really his thing. <laughs> but, you know, he was beautiful. And then my son had a little uh, grey thoroughbred gelding that he invented on, and so I ended up eventing on him and took both of those horses eventing, which was which was great fun. I learned a lot of both of those. The little grey was amazing because you could just point him at anything and he would bust it, bust himself to just get over and he was very safe, very, very nice ride. Yep, yep. What do you think your proudest moment's been? Oh, I've had a few. Um, <laughs> I just, I can't, you know, nothing, like nothing else, you know, nothing outstanding. But on the, the Pinto I had as a kid, I... um. We, there was a gymkhana and it was a there was a horsemanship class in it. So I taught him to be ridden without a bridle or or a halter. So I used a neck rope on him back in the seventies and went over a jump. So 
So I think that's pretty amazing that now that, you know, that's a big thing now. Lots of people do that. But back in the 70s, I did it on my old, old pony club pony club horse. Yep. Um, you know, with him, I took him to the uh, Canberra Royal, which I've mentioned before, and, and placed there. And I won the big chestnut horse I was just talking about before. I actually ended up winning an introductory class at eventing. So I was pretty, I was really pleased with that. And then I, in 2000 and Ten, I think it was the um, SIAC, so Sydney. Um, oh, sorry, not so much SIAC, but at SIAC, uh, Sydney Eventing had a ten-year anniversary preliminary three-day event there, where we yep. actually the prelim riders, so that's uh, ninety-five, actually got to do the roads and tracks and steeplechase and and oh, have wow. an actual actual three-day event. So I w- yep. went in that, and I ended up getting tenth out of that, which I was pretty proud of because it was a big yep. big thing you had to pass two lots yeah. you know two vet checks do the roads and tracks and you know and all the classic just I'd show jumping eventing so that was pretty good and sure. then the last thing was I was in Africa last year and I noticed that Willinga was doing their first dressage comp and I went, oh, I really want to um, go there and compete there. And I came home from Africa and literally went to Clarendon and qualified so I could compete down at Willinga in a very short space of time. So I was pretty, mm-hmm. pretty proud that. Was that on your chestnut horse, your son's exodenta? Oh, no, this, this is just horse. recently. No, okay. <laughs> My, this is my special horse that I have at the moment. I mm-hmm. need that on. So he'd just been out in the paddock for six weeks. I pull him out of the paddock, go to Clarendon, qualify, and then you know, get good. to ride at Winger. So I was, yeah, I was pretty happy with pretty that. Good. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about, you know, when you're out at competitions and when you're coaching riders, what do you think is the biggest problem that you see? You know, and how can you fix it? But what do you see just generally? You know, you might see it again and again. With coaching, actually, we can talk about coaching in a bit. But first of all, tell me about riding and horses. I think that sometimes when things are going pear shaped, um, you know, it could be anywhere really. It could be um, just general riding or at a competition. I think sometimes you need to actually back off a little bit and take some deep breaths and refocus and reorganise what you're doing instead of being reactive to the situation. Yep. Yep. Does that make sense? So, um, you know, if a horse is playing up or um, it's not going right or there are, you know, a few refusals or or whatever it is, you know, then it can't quite get the right lead. I think sometimes you're actually better off coming back, actually even stopping or walking, doing some breathing exercises, refocusing on what you want to do and then then sort of starting again rather than continuing trying to do what you're doing which isn't working. You know, yes. and, and if it ha- if it's not working in the first place, it's probably not working because the horse is not understanding what you want it to do. Yep. So yep. if you can reorganise in your head exactly what it is that you want it to do, take the pressure off the horse. I think you'll have a little bit more success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look horsechats.com. What about coaching? You know, we sort of thought about coaching before. What do you think coaches, and it may not be the same thing again and again, but what's a tip for coaches? A tip for coaches? Mm. You know, you see coaches, but some people are just starting and, you know, just starting coaching and they may not be qualified yet. They might just say, look, I want to start teaching. What's the thing that they could be doing wrong that you can help them with? I think what you really need to do is you really need to understand the student and where the student is coming from, like what have they done before, what they're trying to achieve. I think too many people just look at face value and see what's happening at face value, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think sometimes it's better to get in a little bit deep and find out exactly what that person wants to do, you know, where they're going, what they're having problems with, and getting more into the psyche of it and then sort of dealing with where they want to go. Yeah, so not looking at the overview and the first impression, but going a little bit deeper than that. 
Yeah, so maybe, you know, maybe having a little conversation beforehand, what they think is going wrong or what they think they'd like help with and then, you know, having a look at them and then coming back and saying, okay, well, I can see this and, you know, where do you want to go with that? Yes, yes. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. What about books? Do you read much? Have you got a book that you could recommend to our listeners, something that's going to complement their training? Yeah, I've, you know, I've got a like a whole bookshelf full of horse books. One of my girlfriends in on horsey books says that she reckons I've got every known horse book to man. Mm. I had a look last night, and I think just as a, I've got a couple here. I think just as a general man, manual for all ages, I, I really like that William Milcom book, the complete horse riding book. It's just a general overview of horse management and saddling and feeding and, you know, all different sports. I think that's just a really good book. Okay. Just just say that name and author again. Yeah. So it's Complete Horse Riding. Yes. Yep. And it's William Malcolm. Okay, good. There's a classic old dressage book that is just, I think it's wonderful. It's um, Riding Logic. Yes. And I haven't got. I haven't. We, do you know that one? I yes, I do. Yeah. I haven't wrote down his first name. Wilhelm Musler, it yes. looks like. Yep. That's a fantastic book. I really like that. I read that cover to cover. Yep. It's really easy to read for a sort of straight training dressage book. And just more recently, I've really liked that real life dressage with, with Carl Hester's book. I just It's done very well pictorially. Yep. So you can sort of see the stages of training and um, where the horses should be. Yeah, yeah. And remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books. You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. What are you looking forward to at the moment? You've got, you know, a horse that you're bringing on. You've got competitions that you've got coming up and what are your students doing? I'm at the moment... Um competing in dressage and eventing. So I've got a lovely um, dressage horse who I'm competing at elementary, but I'm training at a higher level. I'm having a lot of fun on him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to a competition on the weekend, actually, with him. And I also have a little uh, pre-novice eventer that I uh, event, or he was previously a pre-novice eventer, and so 105, and I'm competing on 80 on him and I'm having quite a lot of success on that and I'm hoping to go um, probably by the end of the year, go 95 and then hopefully go a, a metre five on him. So I'm having really good fun with those two, both really lovely horses. And the dressage horse uh, was a stallion. And so I've got one of his gelding. Mm-hmm. He's a nice horse as well. So he's just following along with um, those three. Yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yep. Yep. Heidi, just in a few sentences, can you sum up your philosophy with horses into a message for our listeners? Just something they can take away with them. Um, I just think that you need to be open to learn. Um, I've been in the, associated with horses in the horsing, you know, riding horses for over 50 years and I'm still learning every day. I learn something new. So I would just, that's what I would say, is just to be open to to learn just to be constantly seeking answers and, and asking questions and you know even somebody that you don't think um you agree with or i still think that you should be open to listening to them and taking what they say because somewhere along the line something that they said might actually help you or resonate with you mm-hmm. yes yes heidi how can people contact you um, I've got a, a couple of Facebook pages that are set up. So I've got Heidi's Performance Horses, so you can yes. message me on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a Seahorse Rides one as well. Okay. Messenger to Facebook is probably the best way. Okay. All right. We'll put those details and those links up on your page, which will be horsechats.com slash Heidi Hewitson, or else just go to horsechats.com and search for Heidi or search for Hewitson. So thanks very much for talking to us today, Heidi. Certainly appreciated your broad background, but still focusing on your horses and certainly enjoying the time you've got with them. And, um, yeah, we'd like to have you back again sometime. That'd be good. That's great. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. 
Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.